Greetings, everyone. Thanks for uh, sticking around for the last session of the day in uh, cloud. So uh, I hope I'll keep you all awake. I know it's been a long day. It's been a great show. Uh, the attendance is, uh, is promising. So um, anyways, without any further ado, what I'll try to do today is I'll, I'll sort of stay at the high level, you know, the whole, uh, the whole cloud thing. Um, I do have some technical slides in here, so for those of you who aren't technical, just sort of don't pay attention for about the five or six slides, and then I'll bring it back up to the high level again. So what I'll start off with is just introducing you, for those who aren't familiar with Front Porch Digital, um, our Diva Solutions family of products. So we start our, our solution set with uh, our Migrate um, product family, and basically what that is is your ability to take um, large videotape collections and legacy film collections and migrate them into the digital domain in a fast, efficient way. So everything from standalone uh, parallel uh, migration engines all the way to robotic solutions that can do uh, thousands of hours of migration of legacy videotape assets per week. Um, moving up the solution family then, we talk about Manage, and Manage is really the core of our products, and it's, it's based around something called Diva Archive, uh, CSM, or Content Storage Management, and I'll get into what that is. But basically what this is, is the way to interface into any type of device that can generate content or consume content in any format and interfacing into uh, commodity IT-based storage. So spinning disk, data tape, robotic systems, and the cloud, as you'll see in my presentation. The next part of our solution is once you have this content in file-based form, whether it's productions from today or uh, from your legacy archives, being able to now publish that content and market that content. So whether it be to mobile devices, uh, uh, set-top boxes, uh, iTunes, YouTubes, things like that, and automating that file-based workflow where you're taking the, you know, the, the, the very human-intensive workflow out of the process as a whole. And then the final evolution is really what we're talking about, uh, and I'll highlight this later on, is called Lynx, and it's our uh, cloud-based CSM uh, services solution. So you've already heard me mention CSM a couple times, and really what CSM is, it's an object-aware storage mechanism. So the idea is basically if you have video content, if you have audio content, CSM system treats those as objects. So you know whether they be DPX scans or HD files or MXF or editing files or you know projects or whatever else, those are treated as a single entity or a single asset in your system. Replicated, tracked, conformed, um, but now we can do things that are video-centric uh, or video-aware, things like uh, time code based partial restores, transcoding, subjective quality analysis of the content, uh, things like that that are really specifically uh, beneficial in, in these types of production workflows. And it's very, very different than HSM. For, the, so for those of you who are, are familiar with traditional hierarchical storage management solutions where they're typically dis disk extenders in the uh, IT and enterprise space, um, where you drop some files onto some spinning disk and over time if it hasn't been touched or it's of a certain size, they get primarily moved off to spinning, sorry, to, to data tape or lesser cost storage. And it sort of uh, provides you with just, in essence, a, a cheaper disk extension. These are really active archives where we're talking about being able to archive and restore into your newsroom post-production and whatever workflows that you have um, in your environment. So pictorially speaking, this is really what we're talking about here. So one single infrastructure that you invested in your facility, uh, media organization, and feeding each of those different workflow silos. Now, key to this is that we can't come to the table and say that you, know, you shall use this media asset management system or this automation system or this video server or even this format. Key to this system is it really it, it integrates directly into all the tools that are specific in those different workflow silos. So in your newsroom system, you might be using an iNews system and a, and, and a news cutter system. Uh, your post-production might be a mix of Avid and Final Cut. All of those systems directly integrate into the content storage management system and allow you to archive and restore directly to lesser cost and, and, and higher density storage devices and storage technologies. But then also through things like time code based partial restores and transcoding, it lets you share files as files through these workflows. So ingesting something in your, in your uh, ingest facility, transcoding, letting somebody browse that from the MAM and the desktop, doing a shot list doing high resolution, high definition partial restores into your Avid environment or your post-production to generate promos, taking those finished products back in, transcoding them and notifying them that automation, notifying your automation system that you're, you're ready for air. So all of those, that sort of file-based infrastructure is really facilitated by uh, what, we, what we term uh, content storage management. So 
when you look at the storage pyramid, really, you've probably heard this terminology, but just so sort of we're all on the same page. So online storage is typically very high speed, very expensive storage that's you know inside your video server, inside your editing platform, or some SAN-based solution where you have a bunch of people acting on that content. And usually that content is, is, is ready to be acted on in a frame. So when the automation system says play, it plays, and it's frame accurate. But typically very smaller and typically higher, uh, higher cost. If you move one step down from that is nearline storage. So it's still typically very high speed spinning disk, either you know, gig E connected or even fiber channel connected back out to your online. Um, but larger, lesser cost because it's not that sort of frame immediacy uh, or quality of service. One step behind that is what we consider archive. And archive typically now is data tape, but it could be anything. You know, you've heard of, I'm sure, of uh, holographic and some uh, customers are using Blu-ray. Um, but typically it's data tape for the most part, and I'll, I'll explain why, uh, why the benefits of that. And then one step behind that is offline, and that's really your ability to take media out of the archive and ship it to Iron Mountain or to a salt mine somewhere for long-term preservation of the content. And what you'll see is as you go down the storage pyramid, certainly the value, basically capacity versus cost, gets much cheaper and much larger uh, as you go down in the pyramid. And unfortunately, the immediacy of access also declines a little bit. So if you have a data tape sitting on a shelf and you have to have a human intervene with it, obviously there's a latency involved with getting the access, the content back to your online system. And as you move up to the archive, you're talking about robotic load times and mount times, but very, very fast media. And I'll highlight some of that a little bit later. Nearline and online is always disk to disk copy. So it, it does tend to be very, very fast access to content. And generally what we're talking about here is the CSM system encapsulates those lower three tiers of storage, okay? And then direct integration into your online storage. So it's not a disk extender, it's reaching right into the back of your editing systems, your video servers, and then your users are using their MAM systems and automation, the, the natural interfaces that they use in their particular workflow silos. All right, so that's just a little bit of a, of a background. Now if we look at it about one level down, and I'll, I sort of mentioned some of these so I can go through this quite quickly, but you have basically source destination devices, and that could be anything from a generic file system mount, SIPS, NTFS, uh, 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 FTP, through to you know, IT-based servers, uh, acquisition platforms, uh, video servers, editing platforms, whatever that may be. You have the human and business system, so those are the interfaces that people are looking at. So it could be automation, media asset management, traffic systems, scheduling systems, um, any type of human interface device. And then potentially another category of source destination platforms where you're looking at you know, mobile platforms, uh, the web, uh, your web portals, uh, file systems, OTT boxes, that type, of, that type of infrastructure. And what we're looking to do is basically provide then a middleware solution that ties in all of those different interfaces, all of those different devices and formats down with commodity IT storage. And that commodity IT storage can be comprised of anything from very, very fast, high-speed SAN fiber channel, eight gig fiber channel connected disk, maybe some slower NAS disk, but again, larger scale for different QoS. Archive, which is basically what you would deem as limitless storage. I mean, you expand your content by adding uh, data tapes to the system, and then offline storage as well. And where CSM fits is really in the middle here. So CSM, you can really think of it as a, a middleware software solution that runs on a bunch of servers in facility typically, or traditionally, and includes all of these different little components that add to the value of the solution. So it's not just about moving content in and out of those devices, but there's the value add in those content aware features like transcoding and fixity services and, and, and whatever else within the content storage management solution. And the key here is all of these aspects are scalable. So obviously you can, you know, you shouldn't be locked into a particular editing platform, a particular video server, particular interfaces nor should you be locked into anything down below either. So you can scale your storage, you can implement any type of storage that makes sense in the workflows. And the CSM layer is really meant to abstract that and those complexities from the higher level system. So you know, your journalists or producers do a search for footage on JFK, they click on you know, send it to my Final Cut or my Avid system, and you know, minutes later the content's there ready to go. Uh, it's really about that, that simplicity and that integration. Okay, this is the warning. I'm getting a little bit more technical here. Sorry for all those acronyms in the last couple of slides, but uh, hopefully I'm not going too fast. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about storage technology and trends in the industry. So 
This is just kind of some interesting information. It's a little bit outdated now. 2010 seems so long ago. <laughs> um, actually, I guess we're, we're almost uh, a third of the way now into 2015. These are some, uh, some, some, in, some statistics that I've pulled from, uh, from the Conklin Associates report. So some interesting things that over the next five years, the media entertainment industry will see a 10-time increase in required digital storage capacity. And I know a lot of you out there that are, are working for media organizations are looking at your strategies around digitization. And as you're being demanded for more content, you're launching more channels, everything in terms of the storage is, is going up ex exponentially. Now, you know, this is still a microcosm of what the global IT and enterprise space numbers are. I mean, you've heard these numbers thrown around about exabytes of data. So we're still not talking about that scale of data, but it's a big, big critical shift and a very, very, uh, very, very important thing for people to consider before they go out and start designing these infrastructures. 93% um, of the total storage capacity currently is used for content archiving and long-term preservation. So you have a bunch of things that you're working on today, but the nice thing is once you've put in a storage solution like a CSM, at least your videotape you know, archive problem doesn't get any worse. So you immediately stop that. And then you can start thinking about, you know, holistically what you're going to do for long-term storage and preservation of that content. And basically what I, what I did was just in this chart here, you'll see that the trend is still very, very data tape centric. And I'll highlight some of the reasons why. So, you know, hard drives have always have prevalence. I think, you know, 10 years ago when we were talking to customers, they said, well, you know, we're not really sure about data tape. Spinning disk is the way to go. But really the only way to protect spinning disk is to install another exactly the same as your main volume, maybe from a different manufacturer. So you're, you're diversifying on, on the, the you know, uh, firmware upgrade that blows away all your storage. And the idea is you'd have to probably install that somewhere else, geographically dispersed, so you have that, that level of protection. And the costs just become exorbitant when you're looking at spinning disk as a larger term solution where you might be talking about hundreds of petabytes, sorry, hundreds of, of terabytes or petabytes of data. Spinning disk is really uh, cost ineffective and, you know, it's a green effect, uh, electricity, cooling, space, all those types of things. And you'll see that there's a very, very little penetration of flash and I'll explain to you why. So if you look at just the general storage format choices, you really have in, in this sort of day and age, hard drives, flash, optical storage, and data tapes. So we probably have all of us, all of these, except maybe you don't have a, a data tape drive, although I'm sure some of you have in the past. But really there's pros and cons about this. And when you're designing your infrastructure, the key value here is about designing uh, maybe with bits and pieces of all these to fit the specific <laughs> workflows and the requirements and the demands of how you're trying to implement these systems. So you can select any one of these and it's really your choice in terms of, of uh, the benefits and the uh, advantages and disadvantages and you try to balance off the cons of each of those. So <clears throat> what I've tried to do here is just sort of normalize everything to give you sort of a comparative idea of what types of storage technologies that we're talking about in, in the world right now. So I go over everything from the top to Blu-ray holographic, although holographic is really a dead, dead technology right now. It never really came to fruition. But the intellectual property and the patents are out there somewhere, so maybe we'll, we'll see a resurgence at some point. So those are the two optical technologies. In the middle, I have solid state, so you know SSDs, your SD cards, and things like that. And then the bottom five items are data tape uh, technologies. And I have the bottom three highlighted because those are the most prevalent technologies that, that we see in the industry today. So if you look at the media capacity, that's sort of per unit of whatever this technology is. So Blu-ray, you can store about 50 gig on one disc. Holographic was 300 at its last iteration. Solid state basically varies, but it's how many chips and you know, the density of those chips. And then the data tapes going from SIT LTO at 800 all the way up to now the, the TS 1140 from IBM and the T10KCs from Oracle that are in the four and five terabyte per media uncompressed capacity. So extremely dense technologies and extremely fast technologies. To rationalize that, if you're thinking about 50 megabit per second, let's say XD Cam HD content, that's how many hours you can get on each piece of media. So if you look down at the bottom ones, we're looking at 175 hours and 220 hours of HD content on a piece of media that's about half the size of the VHS tape. And it's quite, quite amazing the storage density that we're talking about here and the technology that's been implemented. Drive cost is just kind of an idea, rationalization. So, you know, the data tape drives, yeah, they are expensive compared to a Blu-ray disc, which all of us have in our PlayStations or, or set-top boxes or whatever they happen to be. Um, but the advantage of it is, is that you sort of buy one tape drive for, you know, hundreds of, or thousands of tapes. So your storage capacity can increase without buying infrastructure parts where uh, and hard drives and things like that. You're buying cages, controllers, fiber channel ports every time you're looking to expand storage capacity. 
And then a normalization. This is really where you start looking at it. So if you're building an archive that might have you know, a petabyte of data in it, these numbers can come, become quite significant. So what I've done here is to sort of gone off on Google and eBay and things like that and tried to find current pricing for a lot of this media. And I've rationalized it down to the, basically the cost per terabyte in, in US dollars. And you'll look at the data tape technology. And this is really why some of this data tape technology has, has, has really uh, reached a foothold or a stronghold in the industries right now. The cost per terabyte is just, it's amazing. And then the speed is also another characteristic. So you know, with the exception of, of flash, drives really down at the 240 or 250 megabyte per second sustained read write rates, uh, the, the performance of this technology is, is phenomenal as well. Okay, so the, the thing that you might think about then is in, in terms of data tape technologies, you think about you know this robot moving the data tape and inserting it into a data tape drive and m most of these technologies and certainly the bottom, uh, actually the bottom four technologies are single thread linear. So there's basically a wind of tape on the cassette and you put it in and the other, the other reel of the cassette is actually in the tape drive. So it pulls the tape out and it spins. So you know, the fast forward and rewind time. So think back to your VHS days. I know it's a, a long time ago or beta, <laughs> beta days where basically the deck has to shuttle back and forth and there's, there's mechanical times involved. The robot finding the tape, loading it into a drive, the drive mounting, shuttling, all this type of thing. So what kind of impact can that have in your environment? And, and really, is, is hard drive necessary for the random access versus data tape so that we can leverage these benefits? So what I've done here is, <coughs> I've again looked at that sort of 50 megabit per second sample, but I mean, you can sort of extrapolate this to be you know, 1.5 gigabit per second on compressed HD if you, if you want to work the numbers. But what this, what this graph actually does is it, is it takes into account all of the characteristics of, of the technology. So, um, what I've done is across Blu-ray holographic, LTO4, 5, and, and T10,000Cs. So this is the robotic arm movement times, the tape loading, the shuttling, the average seat times, and things like that against the actual size of the file, basically, the asset duration. And what you'll actually see is, you know, the performance of, if once you get past about, I, I think I zoom in here, if we look just down at that little area there, what we're seeing here is that for basically for any asset that's like sort of a minute, minute and a half in size, all the technologies are faster than real time once you pass an asset of that size. So if your facility is you know, only 25 second assets and that's all of your assets, then you might start to notice the appreciable effect of the mechanical characteristics of the robot. But once your assets are getting larger than that or higher bit rate than that, now the actual performance characteristics of the tape drives, which are you know, way up here, the T10,000C, LTO5, LTO4, the characteristics now you're looking at, at, at a one hour asset, you're anywhere between well, let's say 12 times faster than real time all the way up to more than 20 times faster than real time. So in the T10,000C example, if you're trying to transfer a one hour 50 megabit HD piece of content, it's only gonna take you about five minutes. And that's including about a minute of, or a minute and a half or so of mechanical characteristics of the robot. But as soon as you get the first byte of data, now we're reading that data 240 megabytes per second sustained throughput. So the mechanical characteristics of the system across a larger environment are absolutely insignificant. So at the lower end, the smaller file size, the mechanical characteristics of the robotic systems are, are uh, the dominant factor. But as you, your file size increases, those become negligible. So sorry for delving into that. So and then you talk about tape uh, migration. So the idea is basically like, like your problems of the past when you're migrating from pneumatic to beta and all these different technologies. When you move into the file-based domain, you don't have to worry about that anymore. So the idea is, if the system can move this data at 20 or 30 times faster than real time, do checksums and bite for bite, bit for bit comparisons as we're replicating the content, moving from you know LTO one to two to three to four to five, it just handles it as a background task. And what you're doing is every time you're keeping up with the with the tape technology of the generation, you're usually doubling your capacity and you're you're getting about a 50% bump in speed as you move up in those technologies. So there's a big advantage to it. So really the key point I'm trying to make here is that data tape really is the only viable solution today. And it doesn't mean that it won't be blue or holographic at some point. It won't be you know, uh, DNA sequencing or something like that 20 years from now. All of those technologies are applicable, but right now the viable one and the proven one is certainly data tape as part of the solution. And for all these reasons, I won't, I won't go through them all. Okay, so now what you guys all came from, what about the cloud? <laughs> so all that is great, right? All, it's all interesting and, and, and whatever else. But now let's look at cloud solutions. So 
what we're typically talking about now in media and entertainment and these types of applications is what, what's been commonly referred to as big data. They're big files. They're not your five megabit uh, MP3 files that you're uploading to your iCloud account or anything like that. These are multi-gigabyte, multi-terabyte files and lots of them. So we, we tend to term this big data. And big data isn't centric to media entertainment. Big data could be in mining, could be in other industries like that. But it's typically not you know, a couple gigabytes of data that you're backing up once every couple of days. This is really the, 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 the crux of it. So cloud solutions, there's a bunch of cloud solutions out there. I mentioned iCloud from Apple. The, the, the services-based ones are from Amazon, Microsoft, and other providers like that. The idea here is about reduced capital costs, reduced infrastructure costs, reduced electricity, power, maintenance, staffing, and all this stuff for the benefit of letting somebody else worry about your problems. And they're basically charging you a toll to move stuff in, keep it there, and a toll to move stuff back out of the system. But as I mentioned, that these systems aren't tuned for big data. And that, that was really the key limitation. So if you just go to the website and you look up Amazon S3, that's the simple storage service. Um, these are the pricing right off their website, so it's about 12 and a half, this is all in US dollars, 12 and a half cents per gigabyte per month to have the data stored. They don't charge you anything to move stuff up into their service, but they do charge you then 10 cents per gigabyte to move the data down. And this doesn't include the actual connectivity, so you're responsible for the connectivity. This is just about data in, data store, and data out of the system. So let's look at a real world example of this. So what I've tried to do is take an example where you're looking at uh, a media organization or any organization that's generating, let's say, 10 terabytes of data per month that wants to store that data in, in an Amazon cloud over the course of five years. So in, in year one, let's, I just picked a number, $30,000, let's say, buys you the link between, that's an annualized cost for the link between your facility and, and the cloud. Uh, the cloud storage fees at those rates I just told you were uh, about almost $100,000. At the end of year one, you'd have only 120 terabytes, which is quite small in a media and entertainment application. And your total annualized cost, which is the sum of all those, is about $125,000. You go through year two, year three, year four, year five. So after five years, you have 600 terabytes in, in these environments. And that's kind of a medium scale average archive in, in the environments that we play in right now. We have customers that are in the multi petabytes, tens of petabytes. Um, but basically, you're looking at a growing cost and a total of two and a half million dollars US to store this content, only 600 terabytes of content in a hosted environment. Now, it's worse than this because what you actually do now is you're sustaining that cost of the storage. So this last little bit of cost here for 600 terabytes, it's basically $900,000 a year then forever until you don't want your content stored anymore. And the way you get the content off there is you don't pay your bill and it all just gets deleted. So it's a nice, simple solution. <laughs> and if you did want to download it, you're basically looking at uh, you know, maybe another $100,000 to bring that data out of the cloud. So even if you look at this, at this solution and you say, OK, well, you know, but I'm, I'm a big organization. You know, Amazon will negotiate with me. I mean, cut it down to 25% of the price, and it's still quite a significant amount of, of money and the sustaining cost. And if you remember back to that costing chart that I gave you before when we we're talking about 40 or $50 per terabyte, look what we're talking about here. Basically, at list price, $4,000 per terabyte for storage in, in the cloud solution. So you know, if you're storing, again, MP3s, you get a couple iTunes accounts, five gigabytes, it's great. You store your MP3s and some pictures and photos and things like that. But you know, when you're talking about big data, it's not really a viable solution. But can, can cloud storage work? Well, I hope so, because otherwise I think they're going to get uninvited from this presentation. But um, really, it's about this concept of big data. So that what we can do is if we take some of the benefits of, of the data tape storage and the storage technology optimization, some of the features of CSM that I talked about in the past, and we encapsulate that then in a hosted solution that specifically addresses big data needs, yeah, it's possible and we can do this. So um, basically, we're thinking about a CSM-based solution in the cloud, cost-effective big data storage solutions, as well as now the benefits of this content awareness, so services like transcoding and partial restores and content analysis and things like that. So <clears throat> we talk about you know, hybrid cloud and private cloud and public cloud and all this kind of stuff, and I'll, I'll sort of step you through there, and actually talk about a way that you can actually transition your facility if you do have something like a, a CSM or an archive in your environment now, is there a way to sort of evolve in a sort of a paced Least, less risky way to get up to um, this type of, of service provider solution. 
So what you might have today is, you know, your facility, again, your little CSM with all your different little workflows, and maybe you're just a national archive and you have a bunch of content that you're archiving and migrating in to protect it. It doesn't have to be a broadcast operation, and, and certainly it doesn't need to be a media and entertainment application only. We're really talking about big chunks of data and large amounts of that data. So what can you do today? You can grab a bunch of data tapes, you can load them into FedEx truck, and ship them off to Iron Mountain. So if you work for FedEx, I totally stole your logo, I apologize, but <laughs> as one example, FedEx. And, and the funny thing is, is FedEx is, or, or UPS, or whatever your, your shipper company, company is, it's the fastest data pipe available still to this day, because I can load up 50 data tapes of five terabytes each into a box, pay a couple hundred euro, and overnight it's in my other facility. There's no other network in the world that can move data that fast. So if your system has the capability of taking tapes offline, so the database in the, in the CSM system at your facility still tracks the barcodes and knows about all the assets that exist on those tapes, you'll make duplicates of that content. One, co one piece of that content stays in your archive so that you can restore it and archive it and interact with it on a daily basis. And you take the duplicate copy for the cost of the media, which might be only a couple hundred bucks, put it into a FedEx box, and once a week you ship it to an Iron Mountain or another service provider where they have secured cold storage or to another one of your facilities that happens to be geographically uh, dispersed from where your facility is. So that, of course, is a bi-directional pipe, very, very fast bi-directional pipe. So if you have a failure of your local system, you have uh, a data tape that gets dropped, you ring up your, your service storage provider and they'll ship the media back to you. But as always, there's pros and cons of this approach. So pros, very, very cost effective. The cost of the data tape plus a FedEx shipment once a week or once a day, whatever. Uh, rapid protection, FedEx is a great data pipe, can scale to any size. So, you know, the CSM system, you might have a robot that holds a thousand tapes, but you can have a facility like this that holds a million tapes or, or more, right? It's just the cost of the box and some storage. Um, capital costs are minimal. You know, you're buying one infrastructure that's feeding your data day file based workflow, and the cost is the data tape. And the workflows are very well known. A lot of you do that with videotape today. Cons, human intensive, somebody's got to load the tapes, grab the tapes, put them in a box, make sure that they ship to the right place. There's always a loss risk, but you have your content there. So if the FedEx loses the shipment, you just duplicate those tapes again. Maybe you encrypt it to ensure secure tracking so that the stuff that ends up in your data center, or sorry, in your storage facility doesn't get ripped off. Um, tapes in the shelf are not active. I mean, it could take days to bring the content back into your environment, so it depends on the immediacy of, of how fast you want the content. It doesn't offer any redundancy to the, to the facility, so you have a catastrophic failure of your main facility. Well, rebuild the facility first, <laughs> and then get the tapes back from the, from the remote facility, so there's still that loss risk in, in terms of business continuance. And it can take a long time to recover from these types of failures. So that's a nice, cheap, inexpensive thing, cost effective that you can do today. Next step, private cloud. So you might have a facility and you know you make a business case to your CFO and your owners to say, or your national archives, your government, whoever it happens to be, you build a second facility. So you build an, an infrastructure. It, it could be a very, very small storage infrastructure that handles data tapes. You still have this benefit where you can still ship tapes via the big pipe to the remote facility. Those are active active, but now you can also introduce this secure connectivity between sites too. So now maybe instead of relying everything on a FedEx truck going back and forth, if you have a big enough pipe, and that can be a private pipe if you want a direct fiber link or something like that, or it could be a public secured channel, you can move data back and forth between them. So the big advantage of this is that now you have two active systems. So you know your, your data tape robotic system catches on fire at your main facility, while well, you just start immediately restoring content to your production systems and your video servers from your remote facility. Now, maybe you take, uh, you can use a hybrid of both, so you can still keep on moving tapes and do whatever else. And what you might involve, what you might do is evolve over time to become a business continuance facility. So what you could do then is put in a smaller set of all those little boxes up at the top, so maybe a couple little video servers with a couple ports, one little editing system, a couple ingest stations, so that if you did have a main facility, facility meltdown, you now have the ability to at least sustain a minimal operation at the remote facility until you bring your, your main facility back online. And that's the concept of business continuance. <coughs> so the pros of this is private, secure, you're managing both, controlled and fairly predictable workflows, the business continuance piece is possible. And you know if you're still doing this FedEx thing, you're still benefiting from that shipment of media and the, and the big data pipe that FedEx offers, of course the, the WAN connection as well. 
relatively inexpensive, but what are the cons? Well, you need to build a couple facilities, you need to staff the couple facilities, you need to manage them. Uh, the technical challenges, so if you're having a bunch of workflow issues there, well, you're just multiplying them by however many facilities you have. And there's heavy capital operations costs is really the crux of this. So what, what can we do then to sort of alleviate some of this burden? Oops, wrong way. So what we can look at is the hybrid cloud. So now if you're looking at a solution, and everybody's sort of heard this terminology, so you still have your customer facility, but now instead of buying an infrastructure, you invest in a service, a CSM service that is hosted in a bunch of geographically dis diversified locations that provides all of those things at a, a fraction of the cost of the, of the small data services that I talked about before. So again, same mechanisms. You can still take data tapes. You can still ship those as your main data management infrastructure, so the cost of that connectivity is still cheap. You can, of course, leverage public or private networking through secure channels to move content back and forth between these. So what you're in initially doing is you're basically offsetting the capital investment of building a facility and the operations cost of the staff, and you're investing in operational expense here now of actually having a pay-per-use kind of service that you have in the system. And of course, you can leverage both of those topologies as we talked about before. So same kind of pros as we talked about in a private facility, although now you're kind of trusting your data to a third party provider. So you have to make sure that you do your homework, that it's secured and, and uh, it's you know stable environment, cage, that they have all these types of practices in place and processes in place. Um, but basically those are the really only the two concerns. But what you could do is, if you're not necessarily interested in actually um, leveraging some of the, you know, the elastic services like cloud-based transcoding, cloud analysis, partial restores, you can actually pre-encrypt your data tapes and send encrypted data tapes to the data center. So now it's just storing data that can't be recovered. You never give the keys to your hosted service provider. The, ne the negative side of that is you're basically limiting your, your benefits, potential benefits down the, down the road about you know, leveraging elastic CSM type services in the cloud. So let's take that even now one step further. So now what we've done is we've actually removed the CSM portion from the facility. So this is sort of taking it right up to then the public cloud type cloud service provider where you're actually taking now, you have all your little workflow silos and this could be at one facility, this could be across many facilities, this could be a, a remote uh, local production system, this could be affiliate stations that you have uh, in different countries or different geographies. And all of those can be tied into now this sort of globally diversified interconnected web of CSM solutions in the cloud, providing you now with those exact same services where we're talking about, now there's obviously no data tape transport here, it's all WAN based, so you need to make sure that you have a highly protected, highly available network. Um, it does, I didn't turn off my phone. <laughs> um, you need to have to make sure that this, you have a high availability connectivity, or you at least have facilities where you can now trigger off any production or workflow at any of those facilities across the time. So what are the pros? Now we're talking about full CSM as a service, protected and encrypted paths again, and you can do the same thing. That data can be encrypted at source and decrypted at destination so you don't ever have anything traveling unencrypted. Controlled and predictable and managed workflows. Uh, you can now even look at business continuance as a service. So instead of investing in the business continuance opportunity yourself, if all of your content, your valuable assets are in this hosted environment, whether this is a 10 gig or a one gig or a 10 gig pipe into your main facility or into a backup redundancy facility or in a partner's facility or another service provider's facility to provide your business continuance services, that path can be opened up at a moment's notice. Uh, so providing an extensions like business continuance uh, it can certainly be a benefit of these types of solutions. And then global uh, distribution and diversity. Of course, a lot of your, your organizations are global, uh, global environments. All of that sort of comes for free as part of this solution. So if you geographically pick your solutions providers, they have, of course, different SLAs that offer replication across those facilities. You could get the distribution part of this implemented uh, as part of the solution. And really key to cloud is about this concept of elastic. So you, know, you sell a bunch of your stuff to Netflix and they need it, you know, 10,000 hours worth of content transcoded and they need it by you know, next month. You either build out a server or transcode farm in your facility, you get a bunch of people sitting in front of it doing a very, very human intensive workflow, or you submit a work order to your CSM provider saying, spawn up 150 transcoding engines in the cloud, transcode all of this content and deliver it back to me as data tape, deliver it back to me as files, or deliver it right to the end distributor partner 
uh, as files I itself. So that whole idea about being able to scale and retract your uh, infrastructure at a moment's notice. Cons? Well, again, you're storing your content in a hosted environment, so you need a trusted partner, you need somebody that does this and only this for a living. You know, the Amazons of the world, the Microsofts, as a, as a previous pre presenter mentioned, they've been hacked into, they've been downtime. So those are key concerns that you need to address and, and sort of come to uh, a comfort level with, let's say. Um, network costs can be prohibitive, so now you're doing most of your stuff on a network path in real time, so that all those numbers I talked about before are you know, uh, could be bottlenecked by your network connectivity. Uh, high availability WAN must be part of the solution. And what you could do then to, de to sort of remove a little bit of the necessity for high availability networking and that big, big data pipe is implement a CSM appliance. So a, a demarcation point, a local piece of hardware, an appliance in your facility that might have, you know, five or 10 or 20 or 100 terabytes of spinning disk on the system. It's dealing with all of your high immediacy needs. And in the background now, you're relying on the CSM to take that content, replicate it, protect it, transcode it, do all the other services that we're talking about here, and even pre-pump and pre-charge that with, you know, if you're doing a, a late-breaking story on, uh, I'll use JFK before JFK, you sort of use a web application, you select all those clips, and you transfer them all to your CSM appliance overnight, and then all the operations that are happening during the day are just hitting locally in, inside your facility. So that's another advantage of this type of thing. So when we're talking about CSM in the cloud then and we look at the services evolution, what kind of services could we be talking about? So of course, the main one that I mentioned uh, throughout was really disaster recovery and global replication, content distribution services. So whether you're taking third-party providers, you're bringing the content in or not, you can evolve into this. Connected enterprise, being able to allow all of your facilities around the world to browse content and restore and archive content business continuance as a service, online video publishing, so that idea about taking that, those file-based assets and, and leveraging them. Elastic transcoding farms, facility services, storage migration. It's a nice thing too, is that if you do have LTO3 in your facility, start shipping the, the data center, the, the, the CSM in the cloud, your LTO3 media, and you'll get back LTO5 media as a result of that, trans, uh, that migration service. Global media asset management, metadata mining as a service, one of the previous presenters talked a little bit about that. And then hub, hub and spoke distributed facilities. So rather than building out big facilities with all of your equipment every single time, you can now have centralized facilities where you're maybe doing centralized ingest, pumping that data up to the cloud as a replication, and then distributing from there to smaller stations in, in whatever formats that they've determined that they require. Um, I think I just got waved. I only have 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to rock it through a couple of these slides because I really want to loop back at the end. So we talked about all of this stuff. So it's great, we're storing files, they're up in the cloud, we have them replicated, they're protected, they're secure, but how is that content actually stored and how can we guarantee that you'll have access to that content irrespective of whether you know, a service provider like us you know, decides that we're going off in a different direction. So really is the ideal storage format is about these kind of key characteristics where you're looking at self-describing media, self-describing assets. And basically the concept here is that you'll be able to take a data tape out of a system and put it into a foreign system that's maybe not, not by Front Porch Digital, by some other provider, and be able to totally recover your assets, totally interact with them, so not being locked into a single vendor solution. File encapsulation, preservation characteristics, I know is important to, to a lot of uh, organizations. Standardized regardless of the storage technology. So this is really one of the key concepts. There's a lot of other formats out there, but it's very centric to a particular te technology. What we've done is basically we've invented something called the Archive Exchange Format, or AXF, for those of you that aren't familiar. Basically what it is, it's a self-describing, fully encapsulated container for any type and any amount of files that has all of those nice characteristics like fixity and, and, and metadata encapsulation and any amount of files of any size, of any type, all encapsulated. It's an IT-centric implementation, so it's not specific to media entertainment, of course, but it does facilitate things like partial restores and transcoding and whatnot. Um, it includes an embedded file system, so it totally abstracts the storage technology, the operating system, the file systems that you've chosen, and it's universal. It's the same on LTO tape as it is on T10Ks, as it is on spinning disk, on flash media, on optical media. It's all the same thing. So what is it in sort of pictorial form? Is basically you have these asset components that could be any type and any amount of structured, unstructured, proprietary, open metadata. You have a file payload that could be audio files, video files, MXF files, whatever they happen to be, some ancillary files, cover art scripts, generic stuff like that. 
Um, we add a layer that is the preservation element, so these characteristics about making sure that what you put into the package is there, provenance, tell me the entire history of, the, of this object, what data tape was it created on, where was it copied geographically, where was it transferred, things like that. We embed a file system into this, and all of those bits and pieces get into this one big AXF object, this one big package, and that's what's actually stored on the media in our solution. So if you look at it again, we're talking about this AXF object, and irrespective of the file system, the operating system, the technology, and certainly now leveraging into the cloud is really this concept of this AXF as this file container that ensures that the assets that you have are protected, are collected in one, in one entity, and are accessible to you long term, whether you have our system or not. Um, I mentioned these already. They can scale to any size, encapsulate any type of a, a norm, a, sorry, number of files. Uh, there's no need to upgrade existing infrastructures. It doesn't rely on any of the modern technologies. So if you have an LTO1 or a 9840 library, it's still compatible with that. Um, it's self-describing. So each asset itself is self-describing. So if you understand AXF, I can give you a flash drive with an AXF object on it. You can plug it into your computer system and understand everything about that object. It's inherent because it's self-describing. And the media is self-describing as well. So if you get a data tape that's AXF formatted, you can put it into a drive and you'll see the catalog of all the elements there. You can retrieve the metadata. You can retrieve the files. It's fully protected, fully self-describing. And again, one of the keys is it's, it's an IT-centric implementation. So although we've, we've designed in a lot of these benefits for the media and entertainment space, it's a universal format as well. So there's a website if you want to read more. I'm sorry for going through this quickly, but if you go to open axf.org. Uh, there's a bunch of information and some diagrams and things like that on what AXF actually is. So five minutes left. I'm rocketing through here. I'm on good pace. <laughs> Sorry for, uh, for speaking so quickly. So what I want to talk about now is this idea of links. So it's what we've launched as a CSM service in the cloud. So we launched this, uh, this service called Links at IBC in September of last year. In essence, it's this concept of a CSM in the cloud, so CSM as a service offering. So it encapsulates all those features and benefits that I talked about today. It's tuned for big data, so again, it's, it's about specifically targeting the enterprises that we know well. One of the major benefits in this whole idea about a trusted partner is it's based on our Diva Archive CSM, which is installed at more than 450 of the leading media organizations in the world, government, military. Um, so it's based on that exact technology that we've we've deployed and, and become trusted in, in the environments. Um, we're going to launch additional services coming up in Q2 and Q3. Uh, we have data centers right now in the US, building one out in the UK, and we're going to launch an APAC one later on this year. The idea is it's replicated, scalable, highly available storage for less than one cent per gigabyte per month. So thinking back to that Amazon idea where we're talking about 12 and a half or so cents, you'll see why this is a very compelling case. And not a lot more expensive than taking your data tapes and storing them at a facility like Iron Mountain, but you get the benefits of having everything online all the time. So again, it's built on the Diva Archive system. Um, like most web service offerings now, it, it has an abstraction layer that's built on web services, so you can interface into it, integrate, pull content and push content. <clears throat> we have UI, so we have a media asset management hosted environment, so you can use a web browser to browse your assets and all of that in, uh, deployed in the cloud. Um, really key to the solution, how we're able to keep the cost so low is, is the idea that we're relying on data tape. So we're doing exactly what we do in all these other media facilities in the world with data tape. Content is there, it's available, it's online, it's protected as part of the base SLA in the system. Of course, it's based on our AXF technology as well. So you have that guarantee that you, know, you cancel the service contract with us, we ship you back a bunch of data tapes and they're all written in the self-describing format that you can just implement any middleware solution that supports uh, AXF. And it scales from terabytes to petabytes in these facilities. So I'll go through these quickly, but basically you have the ability to connect in through file-based secured mechanisms to transfer files in and out of the hosted environment, or you could, if you're a Diva Archive customer, you can ship us data tapes as well. So it's a nice way of getting onto the service very, very rapidly, and then you can use the network to be able to restore files out, or we can service <coughs> restore requests as media, so like things like data tapes or USB drives, flash drives. We can ship you back your media through secure channels that way as well. So some of the service highlights, again, the base SLA is you ship us files or data tapes. We'll replicate those data tapes within the environment, so you have one copy of all your assets online uh, in a partitioned system, so your user space is your user space. There's no cross-contamination, nothing like that. 
Um, we'll take that second copy that we've generated then and offsite it in a, in a secured facility that we can get in escrow with you so you always have access to those original assets and you have your assets now online all the time. We'll generate frame accurate proxy versions of all the content as we scale it into the solution, provide you with a web-based media asset management system where we can mine for metadata, you can do proxy browsing, look at your assets. We can provide unification layers then that let you see the assets that you have in your facility as well as in the DR facility and transparently restore them. So back to that idea about that hybrid cloud where you have a facility of, yourself, of your own and you're connected in. Um, service allows for upload and download by file or by data tape. And of course, it's a secure hosted facility, you know, the whole biometrics, man traps, uh, things like that, five nines uptime, um, and basically any type and any size of pipe that you want to bring in, and 24 by 7 staff and supported. So if we look at that sort of bouquet of offerings, part of our initial offering here are really about the ones highlighted there, and then a service evolution throughout the rest of 2012 will certainly start to uh, come back and, and offer some other solutions and other services uh, as part of this, the, the, the overall solution set. So again, it's links. Uh, you can find out more at fpdigital.com. Sorry for rocketing through the last little bit. Thank you very much for your attendance and enjoy the rest of the show. Oh, sorry, any questions, I guess. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I think uh, part of the, the transcoding process, the metadata mining can certainly include file-based QC. I mean, there's a lot of solutions out there right now. Uh, we do have a solution that's part of our CSM offering as Diva Archive right now, and that certainly would be part of what we would extend into these hosted facilities over, over the course of the year. Any other questions? Comments, criticisms? <laughs> uh, it's our own private hosted facility. It's, well, it's a co-located facility. It's our cage. It's, you know, all the security measures and everything like that are our implementations, our equipment. Uh, we could certainly, if for that elastic storage portion of it, you, we could tie into Amazon's, we could tie into Microsoft's if you're looking at moving a large amount of data and you wanted to, to do it that way. But the facility itself, the connectivity is right into a, a private cage. That's, that's all our, our gear. Yep. Do you also try to still keep on the front end the, uh, uh, the deep, um, complicated uh, programs such as? We're not, uh, we're not doing any things like rendering right now or render farms, but I think that certainly could be part of the evolution of the service. I mean, we're, we're a very media, media and entertainment-centric organization right now. That's certainly our first target. Um, but I think the ability for us now to add services like that once you have the content into this environment is, is, a, is a natural evolution for sure. Uh, and I should mention, we launched the service. Actually, it, it launched uh, at the beginning of January, and we have a couple beta customers now that are uh, trialing the service. And part of what we're doing during the beta phase is we're looking for feedback specifically like that on how we can build services that make sense to, to our customers. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, actually, if they're going to make them all available. So <laughs> I'll, I'll double check. But uh, what we can probably do is maybe if you give me your, your name card, I can get it out to you. On the website? Oh, okay. So they're uh, recording it, and it's going to be the video is going to be available on the BV website. But certainly, if you want pieces of the port of the presentation, just let me know. Yeah. Yeah, we are. <laughs> um, we we've had actually issues in Canada, U.S. Sort of the, uh, you know the. George Bush, we own anything that's in our territory. So a lot of Canadian customers now won't store the data in our US-based data service, data centers. So we are looking at things like that. Uh, we have large populations of customers in countries like Singapore, Spain, France, the UK, certainly. So those are probably our initial targets. Uh, we just know that without building a data center in some countries, we can't target those countries. So unless there's a critical mass there, uh, we unfortunately can't deal with it. The one option is if they do pre-encrypt the data and they get export rights to, to export uh, encrypted data, that's one way around those legislations, but then it limits what we can do with the content in the hosted environment. Uh, 
it's a, it's a foggy issue right now, I guess, in, in whole. And uh, the ultimate thing is that what we're doing is we're sort of extending what the customers are using our system for in facility in a hosted environment. So as part of the SLA, part of the agreement is, you know, sort of that they won't be storing any illegally acquired content, no copyrighted material, all these types of things. And without us actually going in and spot checking, I mean, that might be something that we would consider doing in the future if we're sort of pressured by nations about copyright, you know, well, as you know, <laughs> it's, it's a dangerous thing with SOPA and, and, and PIPA and things like that that are happening in the States. It's a very, very difficult thing to tread on right now. I'm getting the gong here, so. Any other quick questions? No? Well, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the show.